In last week's study, we continued our journey with a man named Abram as he continued to grow into the man of faith who will ultimately become known to Christians as the father of the faith. We're following him on his life journey through the book of Genesis. We saw him rescue his nephew Lot from captivity and then we read about Abram's encounter with Jesus in the form of the king of Salem, Melchizedek. And if you missed last week's message where we explained that mysterious encounter, I encourage you to catch up online. And we saw Melchizedek, or Jesus, serve Abram communion and bless him, to which Abram responded by tithing, the first record of the practice in Scripture. This week we're going to see the Lord reinforce his promise to Abram, the promise that he's going to be the father of an entire people group, an entire nation, a promise that is once again being reinforced to Abram when he is old in his age, has no children, and has a barren wife. So quite the promise God is making. Let's jump in. Genesis 15, verse 1, we read, After these things... In the Greek Septuagint, the word for after these things is metatauta. Well done, students of the book of Revelation. That's a a Revelation inside joke if you haven't done that study with us. It means that what is about to happen next is connected to what has just happened before. And in this instance, what has just happened before in Genesis 14, the previous chapter, is that Abram has gone with his militia of over 300 men and rescued the people of Sodom and a couple of other cities who were kidnapped by some other kings in the area. And now it seems that when Abram gets home, he begins to think, oh man, I've, I've made some enemies now. I, I was just sort of off everyone's radar, out of the way until now, but, but now there's going to be people, there's going to be armies, there's going to be kings out to get me. What, what have I gotten myself into? And, and not only that, I don't even have anything to show for it. I don't have any spoils of war. I didn't keep any of the stuff. And in, in fact, I actually ended up giving away 10% of my stuff. My wife's going to kill me when I get home and have nothing to show for this. Or maybe you've been there, not with the wife part specifically, but, but maybe you stepped out in faith and obeyed the Lord and, and, and you had a, a moment of spiritual fervor. You knew what the Lord wanted you to do and maybe you heard a, a song in the car or a certain message or you read a certain passage in the scriptures and you got fired up and you stepped up in faith and, and, and you did it. You, you ended that relationship, you made that commitment, you made that apology, you cut off that thing or, or turned down that opportunity, and then suddenly you think, oh man, what have I done? What, what am I going to do now? And so Abram is, is terrified as he suddenly realizes he, he's given up security, he's given up finances in order to live in a godly way. And so notice what happens in that moment. We read, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, and then underline this, do not be afraid, Abram, and then underline, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. The Lord says, Abram, don't be worried about your safety. Don't be worried about your security. I am your security. Don't be worried about your wealth. I'm your wealth. And as is so often the case, we're worried about things We want God to give us things when the thing that we're really craving is God himself. And he wants us to learn that. So write this down. The Lord assures Abram that he himself will be the things Abram is seeking. He himself will be the things Abram is seeking. He will be Abram's security. He will be Abram's treasure. God himself. Over and over again in the Bible, God tells his men and women to not be afraid. And then they go on and repeat that instruction to the people of God. It's not merely a suggestion. It's not merely an encouragement and it's not here. It is a command. A command of God to not be afraid. And he tells Abram specifically why he and we must not be afraid. The Lord says, because I am your shield. I am your exceedingly great reward. God says, I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I'm with you, so you must not be afraid. Why? Because as believers, when we go through life going around afraid, it means one of two things. Either we don't actually believe that God is with us, or we don't actually believe that God will take care of us. And both of those possibilities defame the Lord. 
They make him look bad. We claim to have this God who is with us, but when we go around scared and full of anxiety and fear all the time, the message we send to everyone around us is, yes, I'm a child of God, but that doesn't really mean anything. He's not actually going to make a difference in my everyday life. You and I cannot, we must not be afraid because the Lord is with us and he's for us. But Jeff, I am afraid. I am scared. What do I do? In his letter to the Philippian church, the Apostle Paul tells us this. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You take those fears, you you take those anxieties, those worries and those burdens to the Lord in prayer. You go to God, you pour out your heart to him, and then you wait for a few minutes. You finish your venting, and then you wait. And the word says that when you do, you and I will experience the supernatural peace of God that goes beyond our understanding. What that means is it's not a peace because God says, okay, here's exactly everything I'm going to do and how all the problems are going to be solved. It's a peace that just comes over you like a blanket as you realize God is with you, God is for you. Romans 8.28 is still true. He's causing all things to work together for good. For those who love him, he's doing that. And suddenly you have that peace. And Peter the apostle gives this counsel. He says, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And so often we've casted our cares even upon one another on a spouse, on a friend, on social media, and we haven't cast our cares upon the Lord yet. Peter says that's what you need to do. It's not quaint, idealistic, cute advice. This is real, this is powerful, this is how the peace of God works. It's not a nice idea. It's not little angel babies shooting arrows of peace. This is how the supernatural, powerful peace of God works. The kind of supernatural peace that lets men in prison on death row for loving Jesus continue to lift up his name and praises in their jail cell. That's the power of the peace that we're talking about. And so if today you find yourself worried or burdened, you can experience that same peace that Paul and Peter wrote about. You can take communion in our time of worship after this message. You can cast your cares upon the Lord in prayer and you can experience that supernatural peace this evening right here. And so if you're anxious today, I hope you'll take advantage of that opportunity. I hope you will. Because if you're overwhelmed with fear and you're a believer, You need not be. God has made provision for that. He's made a way to deal with that. He himself will be your peace and my peace. Verse 2, but Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So in his fear, Abram was apparently thinking, yeah, it's great, Lord, that you're with me and you're my treasure, my shield, but I don't know if you've noticed, I don't even have an heir. Right now, if I died tonight, somebody came and took me out, everything I have would go to my head servant, Eliezer, because he's the closest thing I've got to an heir. And that was the custom of the day. So Abram goes to the Lord with his fears. He's honest with the Lord about his worries. He actually even lacks a little bit of faith because God says, I got you, I'll take care of you. And Abram says, well, well, how do I know? I don't even have, have an heir right now. And God doesn't respond by saying, Abram, you idiot. I said I would take care of it. He doesn't do that. Look what the Lord's response is. And this is because the Lord loves communicating with us so much. He loves it when we talk with him. Verse 4, and behold, yet again, the word of the Lord came to him. You see, if you'll go to the Lord with your fear and anxieties, the same thing 
will happen to you. The word of the Lord will come to you. It'll come to you. You'll never encounter an angry, impatient, fed up God. Instead, you'll encounter a God who will speak to your heart, who will bring back to your remembrance certain verses, certain promises from the word. You'll always find a God who is a loving father and is patient with his children. Always. Always. We keep reading in verse 4. The word of the Lord comes to him saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside. He brought Abram outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. So the Lord, we don't know how, but somehow gets Abram out of his tent to look up in the night sky, understand the world at this time. It's like the most populous sky you've ever seen in your life when there's been the least amount of light pollution you've ever seen. It would have been even better than that when, I don't know if you've ever seen it, when the Milky Way literally looks like a cloud. That's, it's that thick. And this is what the Lord tells Abram to look up at. And he's not directing his eyes toward heaven just to make a point about the number of stars and the number of people that are going to come through Abram's family line. But what the Lord is also doing is he's saying, uh, look at all those stars, and as you try to count them, Abram, let me ask you, who made them? I did. I did. Every single one of them. I'm the God who did that, Abram. So believe me when I tell you I can take care of this, and I can give you a child. That's not a problem for me. And Abram faced the same question you and I are faced with. Every single day, how much of God's work do I need to see before I'll believe him? How much do I need to see before I'll begin just taking God at his word? Verse 6 is Abram's answer, and it's one of the most important verses in all of Scripture. You need to have this whole verse underlined. Verse 6, it says, and he, that's Abram, believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, accounted it to him for righteousness. The Lord took the fact that Abram believed him and accounted that to Abram for righteousness, as though it was righteousness. And this verse answers the question, what makes a man or woman righteous? The answer, believing in the Lord. Believing in the Lord. Even all the way back in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, those who were saved were saved by faith. We're told that they were saved by believing in what God had revealed to them at that time. Abram was not righteous because he did righteous things, but because he believed in what God said, and God accounted it to him as righteousness. Well, how do we know that he really believed? Because it changed the way that Abram lived his life. Abram's belief was evidenced by his actions. You see, Abram and all the Old Testament believers, all the Old Testament saints, were saved by looking ahead in history, in faith, to the time when God would provide a savior of some type, a way for them to be saved. We're saved by looking back in history to that same savior who we now know is Jesus. But there was never a time when people were saved by their works, never. Before the law, under the law, or after the law. And the reason why I say that is because even under the law, nobody was able to keep it. Only Jesus. There was never a time when people were saved by keeping the law because nobody could keep it. One violation meant that you fell short of God's standards. And so you'd have to be delusional to read all of God's standards and laws in the Old Testament and go, oh yeah, I can do that stuff. Totally. Perfectly, no problem. You gotta be out of your mind to read that and then think, okay, this is good. I can have a workspace based faith. I can earn my way into a relationship with God. Only Jesus was able to keep the law, and he's God. Paul talks about this in Romans 4. It's on your outlines where he writes, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So in other words, if Abraham was saved by doing good works, then he'd have something to boast about. But he doesn't have anything to boast about. Why? For what does the scripture say that we just read? Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It's not that Abraham did any good works that made him righteous. It's that he believed God. That's it. 
Jesus himself made it clear there's really only one work that saves. In John 6, 29, we read, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work, singular, the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. The only work, quote unquote, that we're supposed to do is believing in Jesus. That's our only part. When you believe in Jesus, it'll change the way you live. And your life will produce good works. But none of those good works will save you. Only believing in Jesus can save you. And that's been true since the time of Abram. Even when people had never heard the name Jesus, people have always been saved by believing and agreeing with what God has revealed to them. Always. Verse 7. Then he, the Lord, said to him, Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he, Abram, said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? You're like, oh my gosh, Abram. Incredibly, you've got to feel like if God didn't know anything, if I was God, I'd be like, I think we're having a moment. And then Abram is like, well, how do I know? You're like, you blew it, man. We were having a moment, Abram. It was a good faith moment. And then you had to go ahead and speak down again. All right, whatever. How do I know you'll come through in the future? How do I know you'll do what you're promising? Is what Abram is implying. And again, incredibly, instead of killing Abraham in frustration, God responds this way. Verse 9. So he said to him, so the Lord said to Abram, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. Now I love this and I'll explain why. Because my thinking is, uh, you, you know how you can believe God, Abram? Because God is talking to you. You're having a conversation with him. Like he's, he's right here talking with you right now. That's how you know. That's the sign. When God shows up and speaks to you, you don't say, give me a sign. But all right, all right. Abram wants more assurance. And graciously, God indulges Abram's request by suggesting they cut covenant. And you see, in those days, there were no lawyers. It was a magical time. And so th- this was their version of a legally binding contract. They called it cutting covenant. And what they would do is they'd take a bunch of animals and they'd cut them like like down the middle long ways and lay the two halves a couple of feet apart in like two lines. And then what you would do is you would each walk down the middle of the, between these two lines of animals from different ends. You'd, you'd meet in the middle and you'd clasp wrists or, or hold hands in some way and you'd both speak aloud the terms of the agreement you were making before witnesses. And the idea was we're both serious about this agreement. We're so serious that we both understand if either of us breaks this covenant, this agreement, The other will come after us and do to us what we've done to these two animals. So this was a serious, serious agreement. It was their way of making sure nobody was confused about the consequences of breaking this agreement. And then they'd have a barbecue and eat all the food. That's what they'd do. I'll kill you if you break this. I'll kill you if you break this. Let's have some beef. Let's eat. It's a good time. So that's what the Lord has told Abram to do. He's told Abram, get everything in place for us to cut covenant, and I will come and make a covenant with you, a legally binding agreement. So write this down. God instructs Abram to prepare for the creation of a covenant between them, a covenant between them. So Abram follows the Lord's instructions, and nothing happens. And the hours tick by, the day goes on, and finally the family and servants who were probably there to be witnesses start saying, "Um, is God going to show up? I mean, how long do we wait? And Abram's saying, he's going to be here, he's going to be here, just wait. And time passes. And in verse 11, we're told that so much time passes that when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So the vultures get wind of these dead animals and they start circling. And you might recall that in Jesus' parables of the sower and the mustard seed, birds appear as a symbol of Satan or a symbol of evil. And that's generally true when birds show up in the scriptures unless it's in reference to a dove, which is usually a picture of the Holy Spirit. And what many Bible scholars point out is that there seems to be a picture emerging here that has Abram receiving a promise from God receiving instructions from God, but now he's waiting for God to show up 
and fulfill that promise. It's a mini version of the big thing that God is doing in his life. God has made some big promises to Abram, and Abram is waiting for them to be fulfilled. But on this specific day, God has made a specific promise to Abram. I'm going to come and cut covenant with you. And now Abram is waiting for God to show up and fulfill that promise. And it's in that waiting period that Satan shows up and begins to try and devour Abram's faith. Tear apart Abram's trust in God's promise that he would show up. And when that happened, when Satan begins showing up, trying to destroy the promise, break Abram's faith, tear apart his trust, what was Abram's job? His job was to chase off the vultures, to resist Satan's attempts to steal and devour, to hold on to God's promises, to stay in the place that God had told him to stay, to stand on the word of God, and to fight to stay in the place of expectation, rather than just saying, oh well, guess it's not meant to be. Sometimes having faith doesn't just mean waiting. Sometimes it means fighting to stay in that place where you're ready for God to show up, doing what he's asked you to do, staying in the place of faith and not giving up. And Christian, if you don't know how to do that yet, you need to start today. And the best way you can do that is by getting the word of God and the promises of God from the word into your heart and mind so that when the enemy shows up to try and steal and devour your faith, you know how to keep them away. You know what to say to resist them. That's what Jesus did. Do you remember in his temptation in the wilderness when Satan shows up at the end, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry on earth, and he's tempting Jesus, trying to destroy Jesus' faith in the Father's plan for his life. Jesus answers Satan over and over again with the word saying, it is written, it is written, fill in the blank. It is written, it is written, it is written. God gives you a promise. God has you wait for the fulfillment of that promise. It's a guarantee in that situation that Satan's going to show up and try and make you lose hope while you're waiting. It is a guarantee Satan's going to do that. So we need to have the word of God in us so that we're ready. You don't need to be afraid, but you need to be ready. You need to have those promises stirred up, that faith ready to go. And so we learn how to use the word of God to beat away those vultures, those thoughts, because make no mistake about it, the Lord is coming. The Lord was coming to keep his promise to Abram. The Lord is coming to keep his promise to you. It's an absolute guarantee because the Lord always keeps his promises. But we got to be engaged. We got to be on alert. We got to be standing on the promises of God. Verse 12, now when the sun was going down, pretty sure all the witnesses had left by that point, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he, God, said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. If you're interested in prophecy, underline 400 years. God shows Abram the 400 years that the Israelites would spend in slavery to the Egyptians in the future. As is often the case, there was an immediate application and a future prophetic application in play when Abram chased away those vultures. In the immediate sense, Abram had to have faith that God would keep his promise and show up that day. In the future prophetic sense, he had to have faith that God would keep the long-term promises he had made to him about his grandchildren, about a nation coming from him. He had to believe all that. But also, it was a foreshadowing prophetically of the fact that Israel would have to hold faith that after 400 years of slavery in Egypt, God could still keep his promise to get them into the land that he had promised to their forefather, Abraham. They would have to have faith as well. Verse 14, and also the nation whom they serve, Egypt, I will judge, says the Lord. Afterward they, the people of Israel, shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, again, if you're interested in prophecy, underline fourth generation, they shall return here to the land, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So the Lord says, Abram, your descendants are going to make some mistakes. They're going to end up as slaves in Egypt for 400 years. But after that, I'm going to make sure they return to this land, the land that I'm giving you and your great-great-grandchildren and their children. So a quick note for you Bible students. 
If this goes over your head, don't worry about it. You may know that in the Bible, a generation can be 40 years. That's the amount of time it took for the generation to die out who didn't believe God when he took them out of Egypt and they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. You might recall that. In the Bible, a generation is also sometimes talked about as being 70 years in places like the book of Psalms. But here we see a generation being referred to as 100 years. In verse 13, it mentions 400 years, and then in verse 16, it refers to those 400 years as being four generations, so 100 years per generation. And I just mentioned that in passing, in light of the prophecy that Jesus gives regarding the fig tree, Israel, in Matthew 24, where he declares that the generation that sees Israel become a nation again will not die out before the rapture, the second coming, and all those events unfold. You know, Israel became a nation in 1948. So is a biblical generation 40 years, 70 years, or 100 years? The answer is yes. All right, so we'll keep moving on. In verse 16, we read this. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. That last phrase about the Amorites, I want to explain this or else it's a little bit confusing, is a reference to the future time when the Lord would tell Joshua and the Israelites after he had freed them from Egypt, after they had finished wandering in the wilderness for actually 38 years, God would tell Joshua to wipe out certain people groups that were in the promised land. One of those people groups would be the Amorites. And the concept mentioned here is that God at this time had already made a judgment about how long he would give the Amorites to repent and turn from their sin. He would give them over 400 years, all that time that Israel was in slavery in Egypt. But also at this time, the Lord already knew that they wouldn't repent. They wouldn't change. And there would come a time when God, the ultimate judge, the ultimate justice in the universe would say, it's been enough time, justice needs to be done. And that would be the time in God's judgment when their iniquity would be complete. And as we've mentioned before, if you do research into the people groups that God commanded Israel to wipe out, the Canaanites, the Amorites, you'll, you'll find them to be depraved in ways that can't be spoken of in church. You'll find uh, child sacrifice and pedophilia to such a degree that you will never again feel the need to ask, why would the Lord command Israel to destroy them? Because they were evil on a level that that would shock even today. And because after 400 years, they were only becoming more evil and teaching their children to do the same thing one generation after another. Similarly with timelines though, we know that the Lord has given all Gentiles, all non-Jews, a limited time to repent and turn to him. In Romans 11, Paul writes about the fullness of the Gentiles, the same idea that God knows there is a specific number of Gentiles who are gonna believe in the Lord, put their faith in the Lord, and when that number is reached in God's judgment, enough time has passed. He will have given people enough time to repent and turn to him, and when that time comes, when that number of Gentiles is reached, it will be the fullness of the Gentiles. The door of opportunity will close for the non-Jews, the Gentiles, and it will open again for the Jews toward the end of the great tribulation. God knows the future, he knows the past, he knows what everyone's decision is going to be, and yet he still allows things to unfold in a way where no one can accuse him of being unjust. He gives the Amorites free will. He gives the Canaanites free will. He gives them centuries to repent. They don't. He knows that they won't repent, but he still allows them to go through those motions because the Lord honors and respects free will. Verse 17, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between these pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So Abram was knocked out by the Lord. He gets this vision that's heavy about Israel's future, and then, and then he awakes, he, he comes to, but not enough to get up and get involved. He, he sort of wakes up and looks, and what he sees is the lines of these animals set up to cut covenant. 
And for all intents and purposes, there, there is a fire. The manifest presence of God is moving between these animals. But it's going not halfway. It's moving all the way from one end to the other. And the Lord is doing the whole ceremony without Abram as Abram watches. Because what the Lord was saying was, Abram, this is not a covenant where I'm going to meet you halfway. This is not a covenant where there's your part and my part. This covenant is going to be made entirely by me and it's going to be kept entirely by me. Your only part is to witness it and receive it. That's it. And I have a hard time not getting emotional about the subject we're about to talk about um, because when we're young in the Lord, when we're young in the faith, and I'm not talking about age, I'm talking about spiritual maturity. When we're young in the faith, we love, love to make covenants with the Lord, don't we? You know, we love to say things like, I'm, I'm all in, Lord. I'm all in. My heart, my soul, everything. I'll, I'll love you and serve you with everything I have. You've saved me. You've given me everything. I'm going to live for you every day with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And pastors and leaders and, and, and conferences love to have people sign commitments and covenants because it's, it's a powerful, visceral response. At least 50% of like the men's conferences that I've been to in my life, let's sign some sort of covenant to be better fathers, better husbands, better Christians. And it's always been this way. Believers with, with great intentions, genuine sincere hearts motivated by a love for the Lord have made covenants with God. And none of them top Exodus 19 when the Israelites had been led by God out of Egypt and they were camped at the bottom of Mount Sinai. There's over three million people. Three million people. You think you've been to a big church service in your life? Three million people. God comes down to meet with Moses and to bless the people. And their response in absolute sincerity is, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They had the whole nation on board with honoring and obeying the Lord. Everyone. 100% participation. Their entire government on board with the program, right? They made a commitment. They made a covenant. They had the momentum of a defining moment. Who would forget seeing the whole mountain shake and the presence of God coming down in smoke and hearing the audible voice of God? That's what they had. And you know the story. Moses heads up the mountain to get the law from the Lord. And within 40 days, 40 days, Moses is coming down to find them naked, dancing around, worshiping an idol of a golden calf. What? All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And they meant to. And they wanted to. And their hearts were sincere. They just, they just couldn't do it. Their willpower was insufficient for the task. They didn't have the power to actually live out what they wanted to. And here's why I get emotional. Because when you've walked with the Lord a little while, when you've read what the Israelites did so soon after speaking out those words in sincerity, when, when you've had some years to get to know yourself in honesty, you realize that even though you can raise your hands to heaven and cry out with the best of intentions, all that the Lord has spoken, I will do. It's not true. I won't. I can't. And I won't fail just a little bit. I'll, I'll fail spectacularly over and over and over again in ways that I thought I'd long outgrown and long moved on from. Why? Because I keep drifting back to the law. I keep drifting back to that old covenant. I keep trying to will myself in my own strength to do good works, to be righteous. 
I keep going back to the same power source that failed those three million Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai all the way back in Exodus 19. I keep going back and doing the same thing, saying, no, no, I'm really motivated this time. I got the willpower this time. And in Romans 7, the Apostle Paul told us what the problem with that is. It's on your outlines. He says, for I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. I have the will to do it. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. I want to. I have the desire. I just, I just don't know how to actually follow through and do it. Because the place I'm trying to will myself from, my flesh, has nothing good in it. In fact, my flesh wants to do the opposite of what my spirit wants to do. My spirit wants to please God. My flesh wants to please my sin nature. And I'm saying, but you know what? This time, I'm going to stir up enough willpower to make my flesh do what my spirit wants to do. That same apostle Paul puts the dilemma like this, also from Romans 7 on your outlines. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For, for what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, so my spirit loves the law of God. But I see another law in my members, another law in, at work in my spirit, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members, in my flesh. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul identifies the problem. He says our, our spirits want to live for the Lord, but our flesh wants to live for ourselves. And even... When we have the best of intentions, our flesh is still eager to sin, doing the very things we hate, the very things we swore we'd never do again. And Paul says, it's a hopeless place to be. Knowing what we should do, but being unable to actually follow through and do it. And what he's describing is trying to be righteous, trying to earn your way to God and heaven through your good works. That's the law. That's the old covenant. And Paul says we need to be honest. We can't do it. We can't keep our part of that covenant. That was a covenant where we had our part and God had his part. And we can't do our part. It doesn't work. And coming to that realization was the whole point of the law. That was the whole point of the old covenant. Galatians 3 tells us this. It says the law was our tutor, our teacher to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the entire purpose of the law was to get us to the place where we go, this is hopeless, I can't do this. I need another solution. I can't get to God by trying to be good on my own. How can anyone be saved? How can I be saved? Hebrews 8, 7 tells us, for if that first covenant, if the Old Testament law, salvation by works, if that first covenant had been faultless, so if it worked, then no place would have been sought for a second. If salvation by works worked as a concept, there would be no need for a new covenant. There wouldn't have been a second covenant. But praise God, there was a new covenant coming. And in Jeremiah 31, God prophesied about this new covenant. It would be offered by Jesus to the Jews. They would reject it and they would reject him. And so then it would go on to be offered to you and I, the Gentiles. And here's what the Lord said about this new covenant and what it would be like on your outlines. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Then underline this. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. 
and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. And then underline this all the way to the end. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. In this new covenant, everyone would get to know the Lord directly and individually. Everyone would be able to be led by the Lord. But what if I fail? What if I don't do what the Lord is showing me or calling me to do? What if I don't listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit? The Lord will take care of that too. That's why he said, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. God said, when you fail, I've already made provision for that as well. I've made a way for you to be forgiven. That's the new covenant that was made possible by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In this new covenant, the Lord stirs our passions to live for him and then gives us the power to actually do it. How? By taking up residence within us by putting his spirit in our spirit and then even when we fail to listen to that spirit within us he'll take care of it by offering us forgiveness it's a better covenant that's the one we need that's why after Paul cries out oh wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death he answers his own question in the very next verse like this saying I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, the answer to that question, who will deliver me from this body of death, this hopeless situation, Jesus Christ will, our Lord. The answer to our hopeless predicament is Jesus. He kept the law we could not keep. He lived the sinless life we could not live. He took the punishment we should have received. He died the death that we should have died. He rose from the death in victory over our sin. The new covenant is the one where he provides everything. Where he walks through the whole way without us doing it all on our behalf. That's the covenant that we needed. And now we have this new way of living. Romans 8.11 tells us that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So if you're a believer, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Not only to give you the will to obey God, but the power to obey God. We have a new power source, but we have to choose to operate in that power. The power of God rather than our own power, the flesh. And when do we mess up? When we inevitably go back to trying to power our faith, power our spiritual walk, power our good works by the flesh. It just doesn't work. And we still can't do things perfectly, despite all our good intentions. We'll still try to operate from the flesh instead of the spirit, far too much of the time. But that's why the Lord's covenant with us isn't based on us meeting him halfway. It's based on him doing all of it. God provided himself as a sin offering to save us. And God sealed us with his Holy Spirit to keep us securely saved. Ephesians 2, you know it, tells us, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. When you've reached the place where you finally understand how incapable you are of keeping any promise that you would try to make to God, you will find incalculable joy in the realization that God knew that all along as well. God knew you couldn't keep any promise that you'd make to him. And so he made himself the promise maker and he made himself the promise keeper. I'm so thankful for the Lord. I'm so thankful for Jesus. I know myself, and I hope you know yourself well enough to know there's no promise you could make to God that you could actually follow through on. There's none that you could keep. But praise God, he's the one who sustains us. He's the one who saves us. He's the one who works through us to will and to do his good pleasure. So wait a minute, Jeff. Are you saying that our actions don't matter, that we shouldn't even try and do good works? Since we're so incapable? Not at all. What I'm saying is that you can't do enough good works to earn your salvation. Nobody can. The book of James makes it clear that 
We are to do good works, not to earn our salvation, but because we've been given salvation. And when you understand even just a little bit of what Jesus has done for you, your natural response will be to live your life in gratitude to him. Your natural response will be to want to be led by the Spirit. And as you do that, you'll naturally produce good works as the Holy Spirit works in and through your life. So what does this look like practically? What's supposed to happen that we so easily forget is that we're supposed to realize that the path to life in every area of our lives is living by the Spirit rather than the flesh, being led by the Spirit rather than the flesh. And so when we're faced with a decision, when doing the right thing is difficult, we're, we're meant to run to the Spirit rather than the flesh. We're not meant to say, well, what do you think? We're meant to say, Lord, what do you think? What's your will in this situation? We're meant to stop and ask the Lord for help. We're meant to ask the Lord what he wants us to do, not just reactively, but proactively. Every day, every situation that we go into as we begin our day, Lord, is there anything you want me to know going into this? Lord, help me to do your will in this situation. Just constantly like that. One day, you might be driving home and, and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do today from, as you're coming home from work? And the Lord might say, listen, go for a walk and pray. One day he might say with your spouse, another day he might say without your spouse. He might say, Gra grab your kids, T talk to them, talk to them about marriage. Another day the Lord might say, go home and take a nap. Okay, that's cool. And whatever the Lord says to do is equally important as every other thing he says to do. The goal that we're pursuing is being led by the Lord in every situation and getting to the place where we discipline ourselves not to be legalistic or ritualistic, but to just say, listen, I want the Lord involved in everything I do. I want that to be my habit and practice so that I'm led by the Spirit all the time. And in the incredible John chapter 15, Jesus says it like this. He says, abide in me and I in you. So rest in me, stay in me, and I'll stay and rest in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Practically, we need to abide in Jesus. Be with him every day. Ask for his help throughout the day. We're saved by grace, we're saved by faith. Don't let anybody add to what the word of God says about how we're saved. Don't let anybody add rules and requirements that God hasn't added. Don't let your inability to will yourself to be righteous cause you to despair. Instead, let it cause you to run to Jesus in gratitude and thank him for making you righteous and keeping you righteous. Don't focus on, on doing right things. Focus on abiding, hanging out with the only righteous one. Jesus, don't focus on, I gotta do all this good stuff. Focus on your relationship with Jesus. And he says, listen, the good works will happen, but you need to focus on abiding in me. Philippians 1, 6 says that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So who began the good work in us? The Lord. Who's going to complete the good work in us? The Lord. And if any good work happens in between the time the Lord began the good work and the time he completes it, who do you think is going to be doing that good work in us? The Lord. <laughs> he does every single part of it. Every single part. Our only part is to bear witness and to receive it. And then to remain in that covenant. To abide in it. To rest in it. To be energized by it. I want to encourage you to take communion today and thank the Lord for the new covenant. Thank him for saving you. Thank him for putting his spirit in you to lead you and guide you. Thank you that he's given you the mind of Christ. He's given us the power to live for him. And he's made provision for us even when we fail to be forgiven. That's why in Psalm 144 it says, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. 
as we worship and pray in this coming time, thank the Lord. Rejoice in your salvation. Be grateful for it. Be thankful for it. And then just begin to ask the Lord to help you to live by the Spirit. Not by the flesh, not by your willpower, but by the Spirit. Just enjoying Jesus. Enjoying that relationship and being led in that relationship moment by moment, day by day. Let's pray. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Father, thank you so much for the new covenant, Lord. Thank you for the better covenant, that better promise, that better way where our salvation does not depend on us, but on your goodness. Not on us meeting you halfway, but on you doing all of it, Lord. Providing the entire means by which we are saved. We thank you for it. And Lord, we just freely acknowledge that if our salvation depended on us in any way, Lord, we would be lost forever. We would be lost forever. So thank you for your mercy and your grace and your kindness to us. Lord, I pray that you would just restore to us this evening the joy of our salvation. Lord, we know that that even though our hearts want to make these, these wonderful declarations to you, these promises to you, these covenants, we know, that, we know that we can't keep them. And we know that you know that. And yet you love us anyway. You're not disappointed in us or disillusioned with us. You knew all of that before Jesus ever came to the earth to die for us. You knew it even before you went all the way through the covenant for Abram. You knew that there was nothing we could bring to this. So you brought everything, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for bringing us into your family and calling us your friends. We love you so much, Lord.